High availability refers to the continuous operation of a network and its components. In the event of a point of failure, the disruption and the downtime is minimal. To achieve this, when designing a high availability environment, the network must be carefully designed to allow for standby services and redundant connections ready to operate at a moment's notice. You might have a few ISP lines coming into the building using FTTP or VDSL, ADSL, or you might have a couple of connections from the ISP internally to a couple of routers, which then go onto a couple of switches providing that redundancy, then onto the hosts on the network. Even a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply, provides that redundancy and availability. If the power was cut to the main distribution frame, the UPS will immediately go to battery backup power, providing power for a certain amount of time until it's restored. But it goes a lot more in depth than that, and high availability and redundancy can also cost a lot of money. So let's go through what high availability is. In your standard network, say residential, you may have a router from your ISP. This will have a built-in modem, network switch, and access point. Fine for casual internet browsing and even working from home. You might take this one step further and install a network switch and an access point to allow for more LAN connected devices and a wider wireless coverage. You may then add a second network switch to provide more LAN connectivity and another access point to get even more wireless coverage. But each of these points are a single point of failure. If the link between the switch and the router goes down or the switch itself dies, everything behind that switch will not have any connectivity and the network will fail. This network topology is ideal for a Soho network or small office, home office environment. If you were to pick this up and put it into a commercial environment or a business environment or a large office or even a very large residential, it's gonna struggle. The reason that I've included residential as an example is a lot of people since the pandemic are running businesses from home now and require critical infrastructure, obviously depending on the application of their work. Anyway, a high availability network may require multiple routers, multiple switches using redundant links, redundant power supplies and fans as well. Anything to avoid that single point of failure and keep the network up and alive. When it comes to a redundant network, there are a couple of ways to design it. One way is a two-tier network. This is comprised of an access layer and a core distribution layer. The other is a three-tier network, which comprises of an access layer, a distribution layer, and a core layer. So what are these layers? The access layer switch is the connection to the end user or host device, PCs, laptops, Wi-Fi access points, printers, servers, and so on. It's where we associate devices into VLANs and power devices with PoE, such as access points and SIP phones. Access layer switches are usually just a layer two switch. Maybe unmanaged, but always use managed where you can. These access layer switches would then connect to distribution layer switches. The distribution layer is an intermediate point between the access layer and the core layer, which I'll come to in a moment. It's what aggregates multiple access layer switches. This is where the first point of redundancy lies. These could be layer two switches or a multi-layer switch. It all depends on the project requirements and of course, cost. Distribution switches then connect to the core layer switch. The core layer is the backbone of the network and connects multiple distribution layer switches, usually via a high throughput connection. At this layer, you may also interconnect multiple remote networks, such as campus area network, where there are two or more networks dotted around. These core switches would be very high specification, multi-layer and quite expensive. A three-tier network comprises of the access layer, distribution layer and the core layer. These are highly scalable networks and offer high levels of redundancy. A two-tier network is a reduced hierarchy made up of the access layer and then the distribution layer is merged with the core layer. This is also called a collapsed core. A collapsed core is common in a small to medium network. It's more simplified and a bit more cost effective. However, they're not as scalable as a three tier design. There is also another type of network topology. This is called a spine leaf architecture. This is found in most modern data center networks around the world. The likes of Google, Facebook, and Amazon 
will use a spine leaf network architecture. The leaf switches are where the host devices are connected, such as servers. These leaf switches are connected to the spine switches in a fully meshed configuration. This allows for a server to be able to communicate with another server to access resources within a couple of hops. This is called east-west traffic. North-south is data flowing in and out of the data center. The spine leaf architecture is very expensive. The spine switches can be in the tens of thousands. And this one here can offer 12.8 terabits per second of bandwidth. And each QSFP is capable of 100 gigabits per second. That is some serious spec, serious speed and serious money. The point of redundancy is to minimize any system or network downtime. I've been explaining high availability and redundancy on the switching side, but what about routers? Routers are a critical part of an infrastructure. They're the gateway to the wide area network to access the internet. And in the connected world today, accessing resources out on the internet is essential to the running of homes and businesses. So downtime is not only inconvenient and frustrating, but can also be financially damaging. This is why having a single ISP line is a single point of failure. Most third-party routers will have multiple physical WAN ports on them and will have the ability to connect to a second or third ISP. Some homes and most businesses will have this setup. So if ISP1, say was Sky, was on WAN1, went down, the router would fail over to ISP2, which could be BT on WAN2. If ISP2 went down, it could fail over to WAN3, which could be another ISP provider. It's recommended that when using multiple ISPs, make sure they are different. If you use the same ISP on all WANs and that ISP goes down, the likelihood is all failover connections will go down too. So we've eliminated the single point of failure on the WAN and the ISP. What about the router hardware? What if the router power supply dies or the router itself fails? Then you're in trouble until another router can be installed and configured. We can configure a standby router with the same configuration as the primary router, ready to take over in such circumstances. In my setup here, I have two Draytech 2860 routers and a Cisco Catalyst 1000 switch. Both routers WAN ports are coming from my ISP via a switch. I only have one ISP to my property. Each LAN port on the router is going to my Cisco Catalyst switch on ports nine and 10, and then a single connection to my laptop. Draytech routers have a couple of modes of high availability, hot standby and active standby. Active standby, according to Draytech's website, is the type of high availability that uses different WAN interfaces on each router, which is used where the primary and secondary routers would have different physical connections and cannot share the physical interface, such as VDSL2 interfaces of a Vigor 2860 router. These connections could be made different ISPs to reduce the risk of internet connectivity loss being caused by a single point of failure, in this case the ISP, while still having redundant hardware. It's not possible for a pair of DSL routers to connect to the same DSL line directly, because if one modem has sync, another modem cannot connect, or if they both attempt sync, at the same time they will clash. Hot standby is the type of high availability that has both routers connected to the same internet connections. The primary router would use the internet connections as normal, while the secondary router would keep the internet connections in standby or offline until a failover occurs. If the primary router goes offline, the secondary router would take over the internet connections and bring them online, resuming normal connectivity. This is achieved by using a switch to share the same physical interface between the primary and secondary routers and is well suited to Ethernet WAN interfaces. My setup is hot standby. I've got an ISP connected to a switch on the WAN side, and then the switch connects to the WAN interfaces on my Draytech routers. Anyway, let's set this up. My network will run on a 192.168.1.1 gateway. The primary router will be configured on 192.168.1.2, and the secondary on 
192.168.1.1 will be a virtual IP address. The primary and secondary router will work together to keep alive. And host devices on the network will use that as its gateway. Let's set up the primary router first. The secondary is disconnected from the network at the moment. I'll connect my laptop directly to the primary router. And at the moment, the primary router is factory defaulted and is on 192.168.1.1 by default. I log in with the default details, admin, admin. I would advise you change that on a real live network. And first of all, I'm gonna to go to WAN and make sure it's set up to my ISP requirement. So for me, it will obtain a dynamic IP address. I'll then go to LAN. And on LAN 1, click on the details page. I changed the router's network configuration address here to 192.168.1.2. We have to leave the DHCP server configuration as it is. When I press OK, the router will ask for a restart, but I'm going to ignore this for the moment. Next, I'll go to Management, which is under System Maintenance. And I'm going to rename this router to Draytech Primary. Now I'll press OK and let the router reboot. Once I'm back in the router's interface on 192.168.1.2, I go to applications and higher availability. I enable it. And in the drop down, I've got two methods, hot standby and active standby. I'll be selecting hot standby for this video. Under the general setup, the first option is the group ID. This refers to the high availability group the router will join. If there are multiple, high availability groups in the same physical network, then different IDs should be used. However, I'm gonna leave this as one. The priority ID determines the router hierarchy. The highest value is the highest priority. This is the primary router, so I'm gonna leave this as a priority of 10. The authentication key controls the membership of the high availability group. I'll just leave this as Draytech for now. The management LAN interface is LAN 1. This is the LAN that will be used to pass the high availability control information. Update DDNS will refresh any dynamic DNS on the router should there be a failover. Usually this would be used in active standby when using ADSL, VDSL, WAN connectivity. And syslog provides login on the failover occurrences. Then finally, on this window, we have the list of IP addresses the LAN will use. So for LAN 1, I'll create a virtual IP address of 192.168.1.1. All the host devices on the network will use this IP address as their gateway. Then we have config sync. Enabling this will set the intervals that the primary router syncs its configuration to any backup routers. And that's done. Now press apply. Now I can connect my laptop to the secondary router, which is at the moment on 192.168.1.1 and perform the exact same setup. However, under LAN 1 setup, I will set the router's IP address to be 192.168.1.3, but leave everything else as is. Then under system maintenance and management, I'm going to rename the router to secondary. And now I'll reboot. I'll log back in in this new address of 192.168.1.3 and then go to applications and high availability. Press enable. And the only thing I need to change here is the priority, which I'll set to one lowest priority. And then the virtual IP to 192.168.1.1. Click on config sync, enable it, and then press okay. Now that I'm all done, I'm gonna go ahead and reboot the primary router. The 
if I go to 192.168.1.1, it takes me to the web UI of the primary router. I can log in and see that it is the primary router and it's active. If I go to diagnostics and high availability status, we can see the two routers are ready. I'm going to generate a ping to 192.168.1.1 and another ping to 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. I'm getting a response from both addresses. So I'm going to simulate a hardware failure. I'm going to turn off the primary router. It's dropped a couple of pings to the gateway and the DNS address. But after a few seconds, the gateway pings resume, as do the DNS pings. If I log back in to 192.168.1.1, we can see the secondary router is now in command. If I power the primary router back on, and wait a minute. The primary router will then re-establish its role as the primary. High availability networks, ideal for critical infrastructures where downtime needs to be minimal. Thank you very much for watching.